September 72 is brought to you by Molson. What beer is all about. Everyone knew Canadians were the best hockey players in the world. Amateurs could no longer beat the Soviet Nationals. I can't recall any game that I've ever been at where you can just feel the tension keep building up. And the fans are really on their toes. They hardly can wait to see the beginning of this game. Now, the representative of the Soviet delegation, Mr. Georgi Rigulski. We'll join Mr. Pierre Didier Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, and Mr. Charles Hay, President of Hockey Canada. Eight games in September. A month-long celebration, all mere moments away. really about the forum uh, was just that sense of, of, uh, of, of, of sheer electricity. This was the night we were going to show the world, you know, don't fool with us at our game. I've got a chance to represent my country. I look around and I mean, I'm playing with the greatest hockey players in the world. It was an awe, you know, when you realize that the whole world was watching it. All these great stars on our club, I couldn't believe anybody could be as good as, as what we were going to be. But it also put a lot of pressure on us. We realized, man, if we lose this, I... I said, I'm really scared of that game. And I said, if we lose, you imagine, Frank, if we lose, I said, it's gonna be terrible. It affected us psychologically. We knew a lot about Canadian players from the media. We knew they were a very strong team, well liked and popular with the fans. The fact that in a few moments I was going to play them for a 20 year old boy to somewhat overwhelm. Petriak is in goal. Ken Dryden is in goal for Canada. Underway with Petrov having cleared it into the Canadian zone. Canada clear on the boards, but not out. It's Berkman coming up now with a pass up to center ice. Estrada going up over the line into the corner, shot right across the goal mouth. Berkman keeps it in. The Hoffman pushes it back to the net. There's Bernoulli. There's the pass. Plato being stopped. Here's the shot by Sutton. Thirty seconds. That's all we needed. Parker playing up, back to Henderson. He scores! Good shot on the face off. In the sixth minute, we led the game two nothing. But something wasn't right. Amidst the flurry of red and white, one thing becomes clear: the Soviets can play.
by the middle of the period, the visitors take charge. Rewards soon follow. As the opening period ended, only the score was tied. They'd made their mark. The Soviets arrived just days before the first game. They knew preparation was on their side. The national team trained long and hard. Scouting was thorough. They were quietly confident. By our standards, Team Canada worked hard too. It was simply not hard enough. We looked out of shape compared to the swift Soviets. You aren't performing up to the capability that you, you can, can do, know how to do. And yet, uh, and you're up there representing your country and, and, and not delivering the goods. This wasn't the Russian amateur team. That's what we kept hearing, the Russian amateur team. And they were more professional than we were, and they were ready. Those guys were not staying with their family. They were training almost 12 months a year. We trained three weeks. These guys are in shape. They are coming at us. We're in trouble. We were dying after the first period. I remember walking around, everybody's going, oh, it's hot. Boy, it's hot, it's hot, boy, it's hot. It's hot. That wasn't this half of it. It was hot in that building, but we were, we were suffering. Did we ever get fooled? You don't underestimate your opponent. You never underestimate your opponent. But of course, we had. None of the players expected this. How could they? Certainly, Orr was hurt, and Bobby Hull and others jumped to a rival league. But here were the greatest stars from the NHL, losing to a group of unknowns. The Soviets' first practice was closely watched, with equipment old and worn and techniques foreign to us. It wasn't long before most dismissed the newcomers. By contrast, Team Canada looked sharp in practice. The Soviet national team sat fixated, almost in awe of their opponent's greatness. In the second period, the Canadians get aggressive, but the Soviets won't be intimidated. The unimagined begins to take shape. Valery Harlamov gives the Soviets a two-goal lead. Suddenly, Team Canada is missing. The fans grow uneasy. Bobby Clark's goal, midway through the final period, provides a spark. It doesn't last long. This night, the Soviets are just too strong. Skating, passing, 
stick handling. Better than us on every level. Team Canada does not have the momentum. They've given it their best, and they aren't good enough tonight to beat the Soviets. It's simple as that. Seven, three, Canada is in shock. Unfamiliar with international tradition, the Canadians leave without shaking hands. They're branded poor losers. Series organizer Alan Eagleson was distraught by fan reaction. He said, boy, oh boy, Alan, are these Russians good? I nearly punched them in the nose. I said, good, they're better than that. You're, sound, you're beginning to sound like a commie. Man, it was, uh, it was life and death. We went down in the dressing room, and it was, uh, it was a pretty tough uh, place to be. After the game, it was the tough part. I mean, you almost wanted to cry. felt helpless. The shock waves you could be felt all over the world and uh, and certainly through Canada. Game two became critical. With game two pending, coaches Sinden and Ferguson break down the game tapes. Changes would have to be made. The lavish celebrations in Toronto poorly mask our growing concern. After Montreal, hockey could never be the same. Neither could we. Our game wasn't just ours anymore. The game two looming celebration became desperation. Right, hurt. Maple Leaf Gardens comes alive. Just days ago, a ticket to a curiosity now carried great responsibility. It scared the hell out of me that I would have killed them to win. That scared me. That fear factor set in. Can I really compete against these fellows? In hockey, you have to be scared of losing. We can't lose two games in a row. If we didn't win, uh, this wouldn't, uh, this would be a mark uh, for the rest of our lives. Publicly, the Soviets declared they'd come to learn. But privately, it was a different matter. Now they were certain victory was very real. A scoreless first period confirms 
Montreal's result. To Canadian eyes, the Soviets play with a disturbing sameness. Theirs is a different hockey. They rotated the puck around and sideways and backwards. They broke all the rules on us. I mean, they come up and they didn't like what it looked at. They turned around and went back. What, what is this? At times, we were made to look very silly out there. The Russians uh, were that good. It was just not a style that we had, we had seen, and uh, it, it had us basically confused. It was very unnerving because it was our game. Tony Esposito's goaltending keeps Canada in the game. With concern etched on the faces of most, Team Canada finds its stride. Play is fast. The checking close. It appears Harry Simmons' lineup changes are working. People have been in hockey a long time uh, find out that 24, 48 hours between games can make a tremendous difference if you use them properly. We're going to try to counteract. They told me they want me to play very physical. We are going to go with players that we thought would fit the situation. We're going to show some character. We're going to show who can win. I think we had something to prove. It was a highly charged game. Man. Tension uh, mounting all the time, although it's been a fever pitch right from the beginning. Midway through the second period, Faith finds Phil Esposito. His goal will be the only one scored through two periods. There is not much to choose between the teams this night. Finally, early in the third, Team Canada breaks through. Mark Duivan Cornoyi. Minutes later, the Soviets silence the goal. But game two belongs to Canada and Peter Mahomes. The short-handed goal makes it 3-1. Frank Mahovlich seals the game. Two goals in little over two minutes. 4-1, Canada. Still more than half a period to play, Team Canada focuses on defense. The Canadians must be wary. The Soviets can score goals in bunches. With time winding down, Team Canada weathers some anxious moments. The game is ours. The series even. 
With the country's hockey pride restored, Team Canada celebrates. Unlike Montreal, tonight the players shake hands. Coaches Bobrov and Gulagan implored the national team not to be intimidated by the series. To show the world Soviet hockey, Canadian fans were impressed. Of course, Canadians were behind their team. But it's understandable, they liked our style of hockey too. We have films of the series, and you can see how we were received in Canada. Everyone remembered those games because of the wonderful hockey that we played, and it was like that for millions around the world. The Soviet nationals arrived in Winnipeg for Game 3, armed with the growing support of the media. The visitors' elegant play, the reason. Winnipeg didn't have a team in the NHL, but it had been home to Canada's national amateurs. The city was well acquainted with Soviet hockey. Team Canada makes only one lineup change. The Soviets, five. By now, the players are familiar with one another. Game three's play is fast and vibrant. All of the goals scored in the first two periods. Twice, the Soviets fight back from two goals down. Frustration takes hold. This series isn't going the way it's supposed to go. Uh, that isn't the celebration that we expected. I think the Canadian pride was hurt, and that's what, what really... Uh, and I, I think what hurt the players was they felt when the fans and the press felt the players weren't trying, and they were trying. They were just, we just weren't in good enough shape. The Soviets force us to look closely at our game. And all of a sudden you have somebody who is different enough that in fact you're finally seeing us um, uh, in a way that you never have before. Number 14, two minutes for slashing, 10 
Team Canada escapes with a tie. But Canadians don't like what they see. It hurt knowing we were no longer the best. Team Canada began to battle fights from within. Not everyone was happy about not playing. We had promised all of the players, or 35 of them, that everybody would play one game in this, in this eight game series. They were stars in their teams. They wanted to play, they wanted to win. You know, 40 guys can't play, but you have 40 guys who think they can play. You know, and rightly so. Vic Hadfield came to me and said, Eagle, you know, I got 50 goals. This is a joke. This is in Toronto, never mind in Russia. This is a joke. I said, hey, I'm not the coach. You go talk to Harry, that's not my problem. We felt that we would try Vancouver with some younger players and some players to fulfill our promise, and that hurt us. Anyway. Game four at Vancouver's Pacific Coliseum was to be the last in Canada. The series to date cast no illusions. Canadian hockey was in decline. The fans were frustrated and, and maybe a little embarrassed because they were con too. Nobody ever thought to ask us. It was just reporters' opinions. They started attacking our style of hockey. They seen a uh, style that was successful in winning. They thought, well, that Russians is the new style of hockey. That's how you play the game. You're ruining our party. Uh, what's wrong with you? The Russian team leader, Mr. Andrei Zarovoykov, will make a presentation to Mr. Joe Krista. Team Canada wore a brave face in Vancouver. Internal strife aside, two of its better defensemen, Savard and Lapointe, might now be out for the series. Things couldn't possibly get worse. Barely two minutes in, the visitor strike. At the seven minute mark, a second goal. Montreal, all over again. Other than brief flourishes, the Canadians are being badly outplayed. And Dryden keeps them close. Quicker, stronger. There's no mistaking the Soviets' dominance. Young Gilbert Perrault gets Canada back in the game. Not for long. One minute later, the Soviets answer. Right from that left play, that is going to hurt Team Canada. A perfect pass, lead off the coma stick. When Rod Gilbert's goal is disallowed, it's clear we're in trouble. A fourth goal, the fans are through. This can't be their team. Booze has to get down.
We were booed off the ice, which I'll never forget. I've never been booed off the ice before. You could understand their frustration, but it hurt. Here we are in our own turf, and we got our own uh, countrymen uh, booing us. I was sort of embarrassed for the fans, uh, you know, that we hadn't uh, done what we were supposed to do. As a team, as a, as a group, as individuals, we were vilified across the country. With 20 minutes to play, Team Canada finds itself in shambles. The Canadians now the margin in the third, but Tretiak and the Soviets prove resilient. The young goaltender will turn back more than 20 shots in the period. After the team's change ends, Tretiak gets the help he needs. Vladimir Shatlin collects his own rebound, and the Blues return. Though the home team scores late, for them, it is a game to be forgotten. The fans feel otherwise. They've been betrayed. Players shake hands knowing the series is moving to Moscow. But 14 days until game five is too long for Phyllis Buzina. He doesn't realize he is about to change the very course of the series. For the people across Canada, we tried, we did our best, and uh, for the people that boo us, geez, I, I'm really, I, all of us guys are really disheartened and we're disillusioned and we're disappointed in some of the people. We cannot believe the bad press we've got, uh, the, the booing we've gotten in our own buildings. And if, 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 if the Russians boo their, their players, if the fans, if Russians boo their players like some of the Canadian fans, I'm not saying all of them, some of them booed us, then I'll come back and I'll apologize to each one of the Canadians, but I don't think they will. I'm really, really, I'm really disappointed. I am completely disappointed I cannot believe it every one of us guys 35 guys that came out and played for Team Canada we did it because we love our country and not for any other reason no other reason they can throw the money uh, for the pension fund out the window they can throw anything they want out the window we came because we love Canada John keep working hard we're gonna get better on you. Boy. <laughs> thank you very thank much you. Phil. as I skated off after the interview some guy was yelling at I mean really adamant I felt like sticking my stick right down his throat that's when I really realized, man, we are in a war here. This is no game. This is society. This is war. And we better damn well get ourselves together. Only a handful of well-wishers send Team Canada off. There will be two games in Sweden before Moscow. A chance to play on the larger European ice surface, and just maybe, a chance to find themselves. We had been totally deserted by the uh, Canadian press, in particular, and the North American press as well, and our fans. We really didn't have anybody uh, left. Vancouver felt like it was the bottom. Stockholm was. We were all alone, and it was just us. The papers there called us gangsters. Our own ambassador there uh, had unkind words for us. Those things, that I think, kept uniting our team tighter and tighter. It was not only us against the Russians, but it was us against everybody. Stockholm's a debacle. The hockey's chippy, mean. Facing Moscow, Team Canada comes together. I said, this is really going to be tough. He said, you know what? 
He said, I think we're going to do all right. We did leave Sweden feeling pretty good about ourselves. We have a responsibility to, to answer to anybody else how we, this is how we play hockey. Now let's go play it. We play it rough and skillful. Moscow, September 20th, 1972. From the Kremlin and Red Square to both sides of the Volga, all of the talk in Moscow is hockey. Most know of the Soviet triumph in America. Team Canada's refuge is the Intourist Hotel. Thousand Canadians. Where's the peanuts? Right under the garden. It's an elderly room for a I mean, don't grab it. No, that's from the garden. I've had this in 5,000 miles. Where's Bill? He's got another one. Four games in eight days, all here at Moscow's Luzhniki Sports Palace. Bonds of strength have been increased between our countries through this tournament. And once again, I thank you very much for all your kindnesses. Yes, I can, I can give you the, the uh, Canadian 19 that will play tomorrow night. Uh, Ed Johnston. Uh, and, uh, Ed Johnston. And Tony Esposito. And Tony Esposito. Goaltenders. Uh, so, uh, what can go on the limb and... Uh, what, what's the score going to be here in Moscow? Well, my impressions of the team were pretty high. <laughs> Needless to say, um, I thought that they were excellent skaters in excellent condition. I, I don't think I've seen a, a group of athletes in better condition than they were. Я должен сказать, что они отлично катаются и очень хорошо физически подготовлены. As Team Canada steps onto the ice, they prepare to undertake the most unenviable of challenges, beating the Soviets behind the Iron Curtain. This is Game 5 of the Canada-Soviet Series from Moscow. when you get off the plane and they take your passport away from you, you're marshaled here and you're marshaled there and you can't get your luggage for six hours and it's been gone through. Frustrated right off the bat, we go there and we sit for like two hours in the airport. And at the bottom of the uh, stairway going down, there's a man with a rifle, a uh, machine gun. And uh, I said, gee, this is unusual. <laughs> you know, what's going on? This is supposed to be a sport. This is supposed to be a pastime, right? That these games were becoming much more than that. This is Miss Olga Baranova, a star from the Moscow Ice Ballet. And Miss Baranova is going through the traditional Russian gesture of hospitality to guests of the Soviet Union. A presentation of a loaf of bread with salt on top, followed by a presentation of flowers. Team Canada begins game five with the specter of three players having left for home just a day ago. Midnight in Moscow. 
Phil Esposito's unexpected fall helps ease tensions. It's a different Canadian team in Moscow. Lucid, more assured. Game five is filled with excitement. The play goes end to end. Face-off, the Canadians control the game's tempo. Harry Sindon has them ready. Not surprisingly, we score first. The line of Clark, Ellis, and Henderson assembled to check continues to score. Canada leads to nothing. Team Canada is outworking the Soviets at both ends of the ice. This is the team we expected. The Canadians check diligently, waiting for breaks. Finally, they appear to be rewarded. Henderson slams head first into the end boards. Luzhniki falls silent. Henderson is forced to leave the game. No penalty is called. Fans draw inspiration from Henderson's dramatic goal. But 
the Soviets quickly dampened their enthusiasm. Eight seconds later, it's a one-goal game. Sensing another, the home team swarms the Canadian net. Questionable offsetting penalty sees each team playing a man short. And, uh, they're rather spent over this double penalty that's going to be handled out. The Soviets go to work. A game virtually decided suddenly becomes anyone's to win. Little over five minutes to play, Vladimir Vikulov scores. The collapse is complete. The Canadians play their best game of the series. They outskate, outhit. Outwork the Soviets. It doesn't matter. They still lose. We knew we played well. We knew we had them. We made a couple of mistakes, but there was a uh, an unspoken confidence, and to a man, and I was one of them we felt we could win the next three games. After that game, I know we felt that not only are we now playing with them, we're playing better than they are. We could have played another eight games and never lost after we lost the first game in Russia. Quitting, and that, that if you uttered that word in our dressing room, you probably would have been thrown out. <laughs> Defiant in their defeat, Team Canada leaves the ice to a standing ovation. There's still tomorrow.